Jason Jimenez had premonitions on his fiery death in his airplane, and then it happened on Saturday, January 10th, 2026. Many of his fans are asking why this prediction came true and are searching for answers. Let's find out what we know and what we don't know on Taking Off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and this video is sponsored by Mint Mobile. And before we get into the details, we need to remember that six people lost their lives on Saturday, January 10th, 2026, including Colombian music star Jason Jimenez. To their families and friends and fans, this is not an aviation story. It's a personal loss, and that matters. And before we go any further, it's worth explaining who Jason Jimenez was because not everyone watching this will be familiar with his work. Jason Jimenez, 34, was a Colombian singer and songwriter known for his music in the regional Mexican and popular Latin genres. He built a large following through emotionally driven songs, personal storytelling, and a public image that connected strongly with fans who saw parts of their own lives in his music. Over the years, he became one of the more recognizable names in that space, selling out shows, touring regularly, and building a massive online audience. For many fans, he wasn't just a performer, he was someone whose music was tied to personal moments, memories, and identity. And that's part of what makes this crash so visible. When a public figure dies, it doesn't just affect the people on the airplane. It ripples outward to family, friends, fans, and entire communities who feel like they've lost someone they knew, even if they never met him personally. And that's why stories like this take on two layers. There's the technical aviation layer, which is what we will focus on here. And then there's the human layer, which deserves respect. Both matter, but they are not the same thing. Okay, here's what we know. On January 10th, 2026, a Piper PA-31 Navajo tail number November 325 Foxtrot Alpha crashed shortly after takeoff from Juan Jose Rondon Airport in Piper, Colombia. The aircraft was operating as a private charter flight and was headed to Medellin where Jimenez was scheduled to perform later that day. According to early reports, the airplane struggled to gain altitude after beginning its takeoff roll and impacted terrain shortly after departure. The aircraft was destroyed and there were no survivors. Investigators with Columbia's Civil Aviation Authority have opened a formal investigation. As of now, no official cause has been released. And that point is important because right now, we don't know why this airplane crashed. We don't know if it was mechanical. We don't know if it was environmental. We don't know if it was related to performance, loading, or something else entirely, the pilots. Anything claiming certainty at this stage is speculation. There's also been a lot of discussion about something Jason Jimenez said in interviews before the, the accident, that he had had recurring dreams about dying in a plane crash. That detail has understandably struck people. Yo me empiezo a soñar un tema muy delicado y es que íbamos a tener un accidente. Todo lo que tenía que hacer, yo tengo un avión. Yo me sueño dos veces en, en, en España, en gira en España, que yo llego a Lolaya, en Medellín, que el capitán me dice, ya, y estamos listos. Que yo le digo, marica, vaya, dale una vueltica al avión. Vaya, dale una vueltica al avión y vuelve. Que el man prende el avión, despega, y cuando regrese me dice, marica, ya, y marica, menos mal, menos mal. ¿Qué pasó? Y digo, weón, se me soltó un tubo. Yo dije, ¿cómo así? Me dijo, sí, pero como iba liviano no pasó nada. Ya, ya lo corregimos, ya, ya pusimos todas las, las correcciones, vámonos. Y yo despierto porque el capitán estaba desesperado diciéndome que íbamos a tener un accidente. Como a los ocho días vuelvo y me sueño la misma mierda, pero ya yo me subí al avión, el avión se estrella, faltaban... Entonces, cuando yo rebobino en el accidente, el accidente, el piloto me dice, Don Jason, ya estamos solos. Y yo, no, marica, vaya a prender la avión, denle una vuelta. No, no hay necesidad, jefe, tranquilo. No, no, denle una vuelta a la avión. El man va y lo hace, vuelve y llega y me dice, marica, Jason, marica, casi nos matamos así. Y me sueño, huevón, la misma mierda, exactamente igual, pero me sueño el accidente. Y me sueño que yo tenía que haberle hecho eso al capitán. Me despierto a las 3 de la mañana, güey, yo, yo, marica, era un sueño. No sé si es como la situación o el saber que, que la vida es tan, tan endeble, güey, la vida es, es un hilo. 
When tragedy happens, especially involving someone well-known, we look for meaning, we look for patterns, we try to make sense of things. But I want to be very clear about this. Dreams and premonitions are human experiences. They're emotional. They're psychological. They're not mechanical explanations. They don't tell us why an airplane crashes. They're part of the human story, but not the technical one. And separating those two things matter. And also, unfortunately, a sign of the times we live in today, we have to question everything we're seeing on social media. Our team here at Taking Off works to verify video and images, but often there's no way to know for sure. So what I give is a confidence level, low, medium, high. And there's a video circulating showing the airplane crashing a couple of seconds after taking off. And after studying that video, we've determined low confidence in its accuracy. Also, there's surveillance footage floating out there. And it's obvious that one cannot reconcile with the quick crash footage just off the runway and the surveillance footage. Both can't be true. We place the surveillance footage as a medium confidence. Bottom line, Please be careful with what you see. Some of it is not real. Don't share anything or just assume it's real. And before we go into the details of the crash and the aircraft, I do want to mention our sponsor for this video, Mint Mobile, real quick. I fly cross country a lot in my Cessna 210. I'm landing at small airports in rural areas. And when I looked into Mint Mobile, I was surprised to find they have the largest 5G network in the US. That's important to me, to be able to connect when I'm outside the big metro areas. Mint has extended their holiday promo and you can get a $15 a month plan across three, six or 12 month periods. Another important thing for me is options. My mobile phone needs are going to be different from other people. So a cookie cutter plan doesn't work. I, I don't want to pay for a bunch of features I just don't use. And I've got clients in Canada and Mexico, and I love the fact that Mint plans include free calling to those countries plus the UK. You can bring whatever phone you want and you can keep your same number when you switch. Look, I was shopping for an item a couple of weeks ago and I'm still getting texts and phone calls from the salesman. I'm not into that. I don't want stores or salespeople. Mint has made it easy and all online. Remember, for a limited time, you can get that 50% off of an unlimited premium wireless plan from Mint. Lock it in. It's Mint's lowest price of the year. Hit the QR code or the link in the description. Now, let's talk about the airplane and the environment because this is where a lot of misunderstandings start. The aircraft involved was a Piper PA-31 Navajo. It's a light twin engine airplane commonly used for charter and corporate flying. It typically carries six to eight people and many often assume that because an airplane has two engines, it's automatically safer. And while redundancy helps, it's not a magic shield. Two engines don't guarantee safety, they give you capability. And that capability depends on weight, environment, and performance margins. As a matter of fact, when I got my multi-engine rating, my instructors like to say that in an engine failure, the good engine is the one that will kill you. I'll talk about why that that's the case in a moment. Piper Aircraft designed the PA-31 family as a light twin engine piston airplane to fill a gap between single engine aircraft and the larger turboprops. The goal was simple, provide a reliable, efficient airplane for charter operators, small cargo flights, uh, air taxi services, and corporate travel without the cost and complexity of those bigger aircraft. The first PA-31 flew in 1966, and over the years, Piper refined the line with different models. The basic design includes two piston engines, typically Lycoming IO-540 series, uh, one on each wing, providing redundancy compared with a single engine airplane, and retractable gear, and a conventional low wing layout. Performance numbers vary by model and configuration, but a typical PA-31 operating at sea level on a standard day might see cruise speeds in the range of about 170 to 190 knots. Service ceiling, how high it can go, is about 20,000 feet, and it's an unpressurized cabin. One reason the Navajo was successful is that it hit a sweet spot. More capability than a single-engine airplane, but fewer systems and lower operating costs than a turboprop. 
Over its lifetime, the PA31 family developed variants like the Navajo Chieftain with a longer nose and a little bit more cabin room, and the PA31T Cheyenne, a turboprop version. The airplane was not designed as a short field climber or a bush plane. Its performance expectations have always been tied to careful weight management and favorable environmental conditions. Like all light twins, the Navajo has engine redundancy, but that redundancy only helps if the airplane has the performance margins to climb safely on a single engine, which is heavily influenced by weight and environmental conditions. One of the limitations pilots training in light twins emphasize is that losing an engine at low altitude or in high density altitude conditions dramatically increases the challenge of maintaining the climb. The airplane will technically fly on one engine, but practical climb performance can be poor or non-existent if weight and conditions aren't favorable. And that's why weight and balance, density altitude, and the environmental considerations are critical in twins. And that's why they're going to be a part of this investigation. It's also worth noting that the PA-31 was never equipped from the factory with systems like auto throttles or advanced flight control computers. It's a pilot flown airplane. And that means everything that happens in the air at low altitude is a direct consequence of configuration, power management, and environment as determined by the pilot. So when we talk about a Navajo climbing out of a high elevation airport on a hot day, we're not talking hypothetically. This aircraft's performance is already sensitive to those conditions. And it's an area that pilots and investigators treat with real technical attention. Juan Jose Rondon Airport sits at over 8,000 feet above sea level. That alone changes everything about how an airplane performs. At high elevations, the air is thinner. Thinner air means less engine power, less propeller efficiency, less lift from the wings. It also means longer takeoff rolls and reduced climb performance. And there's the actual weather at the time. The closest reporting station that we could find was SKYP recorded a temperature of 31 degrees Celsius, and that's about 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty warm air. And when you combine high elevation with high temperature, you get high density altitude. Density altitude is not about how high you are. It's about how high the airplane feels like it is. And based on those conditions, this airplane would have been performing as if it were taking off from an airport around 12,000 feet above sea level if our data is accurate. And for context, the FAA requires pilots of unpressurized airplanes to use oxygen when at 12,500 feet above 30 minutes, and that's a big deal. At that kind of density altitude, takeoff acceleration is slower, you'll need a much longer takeoff roll, climb performance is worse, and if something doesn't go exactly right, there's less margin to work with. That doesn't mean density altitude caused this crash, but it absolutely means it'll be a major focus of the investigation. There's also been a lot of attention on a video circulating on social media, allegedly from inside the cockpit. In that clip, you can see what appears to be a JPI 830 engine monitor. Now, that's the same engine monitor I use in my own Cessna 210 Lola. And the, their JPI is showing a message that says bad PRB, which means bad probe. Let's clear something up. A JPI 830 is not a flight control system. It doesn't fly the airplane. It doesn't command the engine. It simply displays information from sensors, temperature, pressures, engine data. A bad probe message means a sensor is not giving reliable information. It does not automatically mean an engine is failing. It does not mean the airplane's unsafe. It just means that specific data point is unreliable. Right now, we have no evidence that this message had anything to do with the accident. There have also been claims about pilot distraction based on these short video clips. And again, this is where people jump to conclusions. Short clips don't tell us intent. They don't tell us timing. They don't tell us context. And they definitely don't tell us causation. That's not how investigations work. I'm covering this crash not just because of who was on board, but because I've seen how quickly misunderstandings about aircraft performance and environment turn into confident and wrong 
sometimes explanations. Years ago, I studied the crash that killed my favorite singer, Keith Green. It was also a light twin, and it was also a hot day, and performance margins were part of that story. That accident shaped how I think about aviation. It taught me that most people don't realize how thin the margins can be, especially in high, hot environments. And it taught me how dangerous it is to fill in gaps with assumptions. And right now, there are a lot of open questions. Investigators will be looking at the aircraft's weight and balance. They'll be examining fuel load. They'll analyze takeoff performance. They'll review the maintenance records. They'll examine the engine components. They'll study what other data. They'll look at the pilot experience and his training. All of that takes time, and that's why early certainty is usually wrong. And by the way, one thing on the Navajo, single pilot. It's not a two-pilot plane. So what are the real takeaways here? First, high elevation airports change everything about how an airplane performs. I know when I fly all my long cross countries in my airplane Lola, it's easy to start to cut corners in my mission planning, especially when you do it over and over again, become complacent. I've taken off in my Cessna from Leadville, Colorado, the highest airport in the U.S. at over 9,000 feet elevation. The airplane acts a lot different and I need to plan for that when I'm in those situations. And hot weather makes that worse. Another takeaway, two engines don't erase physics. I know so many people that will only fly if there are two engines, no single engine flying. But in a single engine airplane, you lose that engine, you're a glider. In a twin, losing an engine complicates the aerodynamics significantly. You now have asymmetrical thrust and asymmetrical drag. And this is why the good engine can kill you. And takeoff is the worst time to lose an engine in a multi-engine plane. You have maybe a few seconds to react and do the right thing if you lose an engine on takeoff or, or you might find yourself rolling over and crashing because there's not enough altitude or time to recover. That's called a VMC roll. Not saying that that's what happened here and I'm not going to go into a VMC roll at this point. We just don't know yet. But investigators will be looking at the condition of both engines and the propellers at the time of impact to determine if they were both running. The last thing I take away is that engine monitors are tools, not verdicts. And just because the JPI read bad probe doesn't mean there was a problem with the aircraft. I've had a bad probe enunciation while flying in Lola. I continued the flight and had my mechanic look at it and reseat the probe in question and that fixed it. Doesn't necessarily mean anything as far as the engine. Now, I wouldn't want to continue flying with a bad probe enunciation. I consider the engine monitor to be my second most important instrument in the plane after my attitude indicator. So I'd get that fixed at the earliest time I could. What I can take away from this tragedy is a reminder to consider altitude, weight and balance, and weather. And by the way, my friend Hoover at Pilot Debrief has created a great mission planning tool. And I'll put a link to it in the description below. It's, it's a great place to go uh, to determine if you're, you're safe to fly this particular mission or flight. And he didn't ask me to do this, but his tool can definitely save lives. Check it out if you're a pilot. As we get more information on this tragedy, we'll post updates. And if you haven't checked out our recent report, you can check it out by clicking the box on the screen. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skill. Take care.